Welcome to the Money Talks Decoding Finance YouTube channel, where it's all about destigmatizing the conversation around money and building wealth. Allow me to bring you Money Talks every Sundays. Hey, what's up, y'all? My name is Harper Gill. Welcome back to Money Talks, where we decode all things finance. And today's topic is a special topic to me because this is kind of where my journey began when I started to become financially literate and started to educate myself. But, you know, when I graduated from school, one of the things that I really wanted to get into was home ownership. And I had no idea where to start, but I thought I had an inkling of a clue. And I hit up one of my friends and uh, he's a realtor and we have him as a guest here today. So I'm gonna introduce you to him shortly, but I just wanted to kind of talk about my story, how I kind of got started. And when I thought I had everything figured out, boy, did I have a surprise. I did not have anything figured out. And this is why I wanted to bring the topic of real estate and getting into your first home. Um, because a lot of us have no clue or we might have some information and today we're here to clear it up. I'm here to introduce to you my good friend and realtor, Ola Adebarua. Ola, thank you so much for your time and coming here and sharing all your wealth of information and knowledge with us. So excited to have you. But before we get into it, please let us know, let us let the audience know who is Ola and what do you do? Oh, well, first off, thank you for having me. You're very um, welcome. And what's up to everybody? Like Harpreet said, my name is Ola. Um, I grew up in Finch. Um, I actually know, know Harpreet for almost ever, right? <laughs> yeah. And we're from elementary school. Then we went to school together in middle school as well. Uh, we worked for Parks and Rec for the city of Toronto. We've done some youth work for nonprofit organizations. Um, I'm a people's person. Um, I love people, and I think if you ask people around, they'll tell you that they love me too. Um, I've worked with students with autism. Right. Right. Um, it's a really rewarding job, and, and I did that for uh, about seven years, and I enjoyed it. But at some point, I was like, I also need something else to go on top of working with uh, that job financially to bring me to the next step. Uh, so from there, I just started researching, you know, just go on my computer, go on my phone or whatever. And I knew uh, maybe around high school, I, I did have some interest in real estate, but I didn't really know what I was getting myself into at that point. So I did research, did the exams, um, passed it, uh, got my license. I am a registered realtor with Home Life Miracle. Um, and like I said earlier, originally when I did it, it was, it was to take myself to the next step financially. But as I started doing it, I started realizing how much, how rewarding it is uh, for my clients. Right. Um, it, it's actually, very, I'm not comparing it to the, uh, the reward of working with kids with autism, but if you have people coming up to you and say, hey, you know what? I've been working with Ola and he helped me get into a house. I've never right. seen myself getting into a house or getting into investments. Um, it, it, it's a really rewarding thing. Now, it, I started a wealth brand and uh, I need to bring it back a little bit. <laughs> yes, bring it all the way back. <laughs> um, so with the wealth brand now, uh, as I was saying, helping out some of my clients, right? right. Uh, they, they've made six figures, seven figures, right? It's now a generational wealth, right? right? It's not just about, oh, I made $5,000 today. I have $20,000 saved now. I have, it's now I have... $500,000 and I own a property right. or I own a house and I own a condo investment. Now my children can be set. I can pass it down to my children. I can teach my children about assets, right? right? So it's, it's a big thing. So now that's how, where I'm going now with the wealth brand and trying to talk, teach everybody, educate everybody uh, step by step of how to own property, how to own assets, um, how to be, uh, own, be, be wealthy, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I love working with you because I know that our core values align so much. Obviously, we both have um, experience working with people, in particularly in the social services sector. And, you know, we're both now doing something completely different than our, our normal line of work. And I think that, you know, for myself, that was really the reason as why I got, you know, involved in financial planning in the first place was because I know that it was going to be a different type of uh, 
feeling a different type of reward because now you're setting people up generationally as opposed to just dealing with whatever particular issues are 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 there at that moment and that time and exactly. really just kind of getting people educated about a topic that clearly the school system doesn't want any of us to know any of this right and so exactly 100 edu educators in a different type of way that's gonna lead people to learn how to fish as opposed to feeding them you know yeah <clears throat> so one of the you know most biggest purchases that anyone is going to make is uh real estate and i know that real estate is such a broad topic and today we're going to in particularly focus on the first time home buyer so the first question i want to ask you is that what are some of the steps that people should really think about and take into consideration when they're planning to buy their first home okay um so there are a few steps that you can take um no particular order but we'll, we're going to start with the first one we're going to start with credit right all right credit is a big one Absolutely. Uh, I, i've dealt with people who have amazing credit and they're proud of themselves and i have people who have poor credit and they just don't know which direction to go um but in either case um for those who don't know you, your credit it, it, it generally ranges from 300 to 850 okay and the higher number of course 850 it's better the lower number it's not as it's not good uh the two main uh, credit companies that i recommend and most of us would recommend is equifax and transunion right okay um and more importantly just recently in july the minimum credit score to get an insured mortgage would be a score of 680 Okay, so just okay. to emphasize to the audience, the minimum score that you need to be able to get a home is 680. Right, so, and we'll get in more details about that later, but that's if you put down less than 20%, so for the insured mortgage, yes, right. 680 score. And there may be some flexibility if your income and everything is good, of course, uh, if your credit may be like 670, 675, so, but the, the score that they're targeting is 680, okay? Right. Um, so I know some people, like I said, I, some people, they get nervous and they get discouraged because like, they're like, oh, my credit is, is bad. I, I can never get up to 680, but really 680 is not that high. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so a couple of pointers to build your credit is first of all, go and pull your credit score, credit summary. Okay. When you pull your credit summary, then, and you read through it then you'll understand that maybe there's something on there that you have already paid off and they just never pulled off, mm -hmm. okay? Or maybe there's something on there that you just forgot about and now you'll remember, okay? So, because if you're lower your debt levels, they'll have a, a positive impact on your credit score, okay? Right. So if you see any errors on it, then you should have it disputed right away, right. okay? Another uh, key thing to build your credit right, is to not maximize everything. I know some people, you, you get your credit card, you get excited, and that's what happens, especially when you're younger, maybe you don't know better, and you get a $5,000 credit card, and you spend $4,000, mm -hmm. right? And now you maximize, you're maximizing your, your credit cards, and then maybe you have your student loans on top of that, now everything is just adding up, okay? Right. So if you have like a credit card, try to pay it down as much as possible, keep it on the lower end. I'm not saying you have to pay it off completely, or keep it on the lower end, okay? And right. try not to miss any payments, okay? Because you can be doing so good and make payments, make payments, and it'll be slowly going up, and then you miss a one or two payments, and it just comes down, mm -hmm. okay? So every month, even if you don't have uh, a large amount to pay on it, just pay the minimum payment, okay? Consider any missed payment a blemish on your credit score, and you do not want that. I'm so glad that you mentioned those things. And that's something that I emphasize on a regular basis that, you know, uh, those two factors, you know, having your um, debt utilization rate at a 30% or below is so crucial because that makes up 30% of your overall credit score. And so if you are using more than 30% of what's available to you, it does start to slowly have a negative impact on your credit score. Sometimes I see people maxing out their credit card and I have to tell people like bring that down because once you bring the amount that you're using on your credit card down, 
it helps to um, build your credit score. And, you know, you mentioned that 680 is not hard. It definitely isn't. Like for someone like myself who went from the four, early 400s, late 300 score, where my credit score was in that for a long time, once I understood what I needed to do, I really saw a drastic improvement in my credit score where now it's like in the 800s. And so it's really possible to do that. And then also obviously making sure that you make your payments on time. Um, even if it's at least the minimum payments, you have to maintain that, that um, regular habit of paying your, your bills on time. Usually with credit exactly. cards, there's a 21 you know, payday um, cycle. Uh, and that takes a 35% hit on your credit score. So just those two factors alone, your utilization rate plus your payment history makes up more than 50% of your overall credit score. So those are so important. Yeah, and I'm both shocked that your score was 400, but proud as well that your credit is now <laughs> over 800. <laughs> my, my, you know, when I was younger, I talked about this in another episode when we talked about debt, like, I was nice, you know, um, people asked to use my name, didn't really think much of it, uh, didn't understand credit. I just thought I was doing the friendly thing to do, you know, and um, when I seen that people were paying their bills, to me, I kind of took it as like, okay, well, that's not my bill. I didn't use it. I don't want to pay for it. But you quickly realize that it doesn't matter if you use it or not. It's your name that's attached to that loan. And if makes a huge difference whether or not anybody's going to approve you for any sort of loan like forget mortgages you barely could get a phone plan in your name right exactly and and, and you're living proof that your credit score can grow and get to a high number so right that, that that's really good but yeah be, be cautious of lending out your card putting stuff in your name like like harper just mentioned all right uh so next up i guess um after your credit you check everything uh your down payment. Of course, all of these steps are going to be big and important. So the next one is, of course, the down payment. Um, buying your first home, of course, you're usually going to need uh, a mortgage unless you're rich. Uh, you have millions of dollars and you can just buy it out cash and that's fine. Um, but a mortgage is obviously when the lender uh, loans you money and you just pay it back over time. Okay. So in terms of the down payment, the minimum percentage that you're going to have to put down, it's going to vary depending on the price. Okay, so if it's under 500000 so if you're buying a house that's 500000 for example, the minimum that you have to put down is 5%. Right. So that would be, for example, $25,000. 5% of $500,000 is $25,000 down payment that you need. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, where, where it can get a little bit confusing uh, but not really, is if you're buying a home between $500,000 and under a million dollars, you'll need to pay 5% of the first 500000 and 10% of the rest of the price. Okay, so what that means is if you buy, if, if you buy a house of $600,000, the first $500,000, you're going to put 5% of that. And we already seen that at would be $25,000. Right. The remaining one hundred thousand dollars that totals the six hundred thousand, you put ten percent of only the one hundred thousand dollars, which is another ten thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. Which combined for your down payment now on six hundred thousand dollar property is thirty five thousand dollars. So and now, just to kind of make sure uh, we understand that properly, that if you're buying your first home, it is a minimum of five percent, depending on how much. Your, your purchase prices. So example, if you're buying a $500,000 price in a home, then 5% of that. But if let's just say your first home is 600,000, then 5% would be on the 500,000 and then 10% would be on anything additional, which is the additional $100,000, correct? Exactly, correct, 100% correct. And then after that, of course, uh, if you're looking at a property over $1 million, the minimum down payment for that is 20%. Got okay? it. Right. Which very well could be the case in the city because the average house on a, is going for about seven eight hundred thousand now. Exactly. So keep that in mind. Um, and then we were talking about the whole if you put down under twenty percent, uh, the CMHC insurance. So the CMHC, they're the Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And what they do is they protect the lender or the banks in case people can't pay their mortgage, okay? So if you pay less than 20%, they are going to be involved in your mortgage, right? And those are, are what's known as a high ratio mortgage, right? If you put down 20% or more, then you don't have to worry about that. I know a lot of people like to ask me, uh, do you recommend me putting down 20% or do you recommend me putting down 5% or 10%? Okay. And my advice is usually I just encourage them to put down what they're comfortable with. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but ideally if you have the 20% and then some, because of course there's going to be closing costs and everything like that, you right. want also some savings, then I recommend that you put down the 20%. And the reason is, um, for example, if you buy a property that's $600,000, right and you don't put down the 20%, right. you're going to be looking at another $20,000 uh, added to your mortgage. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you don't have to necessarily pay the $20,000 up front, but it gets rolled into your mortgage and it's just an unwanted cost that you have to pay. Right. Okay. And on top of that, also, if you put down 20% versus putting down 5% on the $600,000 property, you're looking at saving at about $400 a month on your monthly mortgage, on your monthly right. payment, okay? And of course, you can save interest over, over that, that term of period if you put down uh, more than 20% 20, 20 or more. Um, however, right, what I also tell them is that I understand that 20% is no cakewalk to collect, right? To save up, it's a lot of money. I, we, I understand that, right? So once again, it's what you can afford. And if you can afford to only put down 5% or 10% and you can get yourself into a home, you should absolutely be proud of yourself to do that. And, and I'm so glad that you kind of mentioned that because it is kind of a double-edged sword where you're like, you know, I want to put 20% down because you want to eliminate those additional um, interest rates. Uh, but at the same time, like you said, you know, saving up 20% is definitely no walk in the park. Uh, it, it's going to take discipline and some crazy hard work to be able to do that and it's like one of those things where it's like the cost of housing is going up as we all know it now um and we have no idea what the future has in store whether it's going to continue going up whether it's going to stay stagnant for a little bit um we really don't know um not even the most sophisticated investors will know this stuff right because you just never know what's going to happen with the economy and i think it's so exactly. important to kind of emphasize to people that you kind of have to ask yourself what's priority is it priority to save on the interest rates or is it priority to get into the house because you can say you know what i want to save 20 percent um but then it might take you an additional two three four years to save that and the cost of housing is just going to continue to increase and now your 20 percent is no longer let's say a hundred thousand your 20 percent can be like 120,000, which becomes even more challenging to save up. And so I think that's the thing that people need to really be wary about and kind of be conscious of knowing that, are you trying to get into your house as soon as possible and you're willing to potentially pay those extra fees? And I think that what can also happen is that I think sometimes it's best to get into the house and then figure out ways of how you can reduce your amortization period on your home once you're actually in it at least you know you're not buying a house that you could have gotten for a hundred thousand dollars cheaper or fifty thousand dollars cheaper depending on whatever the case is obviously i'm just throwing arbitrary numbers but just kind of giving that idea as well right yeah the facts are there what, what, what you're saying yes are there any other th other factors that you um encourage someone to look at um yeah so well in in terms of um your down payment, everything, there's other fees that you're going to have to pay. Uh, keep in mind, okay, so when you have put down 5% or 10% or 20%, your down payment, it actually gets rolled into your mortgage, right? So it's kind of like a savings or your equity, right? right? So when you sell the property, if the market stays the same or goes up, once you sell your property at some point, you will get back your down payment and whatever it went up. So that's if it stays the same or goes up, you'll get your full down payment back, plus you'll get uh, whatever the market has went up, the value of your property went gone up, okay? And right. the reason why I'm saying that is because now when we come to closing costs, these are fees that you're going to have to pay and you're not going to see again. So your closing costs, 
uh, you, you, those are fees that you're not going to see again. So you're going to be paying uh, the land transfer taxes. You're going to be paying the lawyers, the adjustment uh, fees, the closing adjustment. Uh, if it's a condo, the status certificate fee. Um, so I can just give you some numbers on that quickly. And we're going to stick with the whole $600,000 if you buy a purchase of a price, because it's going to vary, especially the land transfer tax. It's going to go up or down uh, depending on the price of the property. Okay. Right. So if you buy a price uh, property that is $600,000, okay, this is where uh, as a first home buyer, you can save a lot. All right. So if your house is in Toronto, first of all, you're going to have to pay the Ontario land transfer tax. Hmm. and the Toronto land transfer tax. If it's anywhere else, Durham region, Peel region, you only have to pay the Ontario land transfer tax. Right. So if you're not a first time home buyer on a $600,000 property, you're looking at approximately paying just on the land transfer tax for Ontario and Toronto, $17,000. Right. If you're a wow. first time home buyer, you're gonna save- 17,000, did you say dollars? 17,000. Oh, geez, people, for, did you guys hear that? Oh my goodness, all right. <laughs> yeah, so ho ho hopefully, hopefully you, when you, if you're not a first time home buyer and you bought a different property and hopefully you bought the right property and you sold it and you made enough money where this stuff doesn't matter, right? right. But it's still a lot of money any way you look at it, okay? Right. So yeah, about $17,000. If you're a first time home buyer, so, you're gonna save about four, a maximum of $4,000 under the material land transfer tax and a maximum of $4,475 on the Toronto land transfer tax. So that saves you about $8,500, right? So now you're in the range of just for your uh, land transfer tax is about $8,509,000. Right. So from, from, from $17,000, now you're only looking at about $8,509,000, okay? Right. And if it's, Outside of Toronto, like I said, in um, Durham region or Peel region, now you you could save another almost forty five hundred because you don't have to pay the Toronto uh, land transfer tax. So now that brings you to only about five thousand dollars for your land transfer tax. Okay, because you only have to pay the Ontario land transfer tax at that point. Right. Okay. Uh, the other closing costs, like I said, you're looking at uh, title insurance, legal fees and disbursement, closing adjustments, home insurance. Uh, on the low end, you're looking at about 5000 On the high end, you're looking at about $8,000, right. right? So in total now for your closing costs, if you're a first home, a first time home buyer, you're looking at about, in Toronto, you're looking at about 14000 to 17000 mm. Okay, total. If if it's outside of Toronto, you're looking at approximately ten thousand dollars to thirteen thousand dollars. Right. Okay. So there's some good savings there as a first-time home buyer. And you know what? I'm so glad that you're mentioning these hidden costs and fees because that's the, that's why I really love working with you is because I know that you're, you know, very honest and you keep it super all the way 100 with people. Um, and I'm so, you know, cautious of who I refer people to, because I want to make sure that the people I'm actually, um, working with are, are, like I said, aligned with my values, aligned with my brand and my mission, because, you know, there's often times where I've, I've heard some horror stories with real estate agents. Um, and it's so important for us to do our due diligence and really be picking someone that is going to have our best interests at heart, because, I remember the first time you and I connected and I got my first property through you. You were like, Harper, you need to do X, Y, and Z. You need to go see a lawyer, make sure they put a cap on this um, builder's fee and all this kind of stuff. And I would have not, like if it was anybody else, I don't know if I would have gotten the same um, exposure to that knowledge. And I, it's already nerve wracking buying your first home. Like I remember my like experience, it just felt like an emotional roller coaster. I cannot imagine going into, you know, home ownership or buying a home or whatever the case may be, like blindly without knowing all the hidden fees that are associated with it. Because I always tell people in order for us to properly plan to get to where we need to be, 
we need to know what comes along with that plan. So, you know, because a lot of times we do just get fixated on the down payment. We're not thinking about the closer, closing costs, the inspection fees, the lawyer fees and everything in between. And it's so important to do that because, you know, it's like a slip away from losing everything that you've worked so hard for, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And nothing has changed from the day that we sat down and talked about property uh, as I've been growing and learning and um, uh, gaining more clients or family, because I call my clients or family, it, it, it is a family um, brand for me. So I will sit you down. I know right now we're going through some numbers pretty quickly and everything, but I will sit you down because I am not going to play around with your money. I am going to tell you exactly what it is, what you need to come up with, um, how it is going to cost, um, and educate you in that way so that you can be prepared as best as possible right. for what's to come. And I'm not going to try to scare you, but it may seem scary at the time because I want you to be prepared. Yes. Right. Yes. And it's true. Like what you said, you're not trying to scare anybody. And that's the same thing, you know, that I tell people too, is that when I'm telling you the truth, it's not to scare you, it's to prepare you. So that way you can mitigate as many mistakes as possible because you know, buying a home is, like I said, it, it takes a lot of hard work, a lot of effort, energy. And, you know, I would feel horrible with myself thinking that, geez, I saved up 20% and that 20% went down the drain because I didn't know the things that came along with this outside of the fat of the down payment, right? But um, are there, uh, I, I know we talked about, um, you know, some of the closing, uh, some of the hidden costs, but there are there any others that people should be wary of? Like, I really want you to kind of touch on that, uh, the fact uh, when you're buying a new build, why it's important to go to a lawyer and get a cap on the builder's fees. Why is it so important for people to be conscious of that? There's a resale option and there are pre-construction. So when, when you're looking into pre-constructions, um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot more fees and hidden fees and stuff that only the the lawyers you, i always recommend 100 percent to go bring it to a lawyer and a, and a great lawyer at that who can look over everything right because uh, they have what's called development charges and levy charges for building in that city and the road um uh with the schools and everything so if you don't have that number capped when closing time comes they can just give you a number and say, hey, you know what? This is what we're charged for doing. This is what we're charging you. You owe us $20,000. It's in right. the documents. You can't get out of it. We'll keep your property if you do not pay this money and we'll sell it off. We'll keep your down, your deposit, right. uh, your down payment, everything. Okay. So you want one. And I would always, I, I never bring my clients into a, a pre-construction that's not capped. When right. it's capped, if, they, if the builder says that, we're capping this project at $7,000 on closing those fees. Anyways, it's going to be capped at 7,000. If it's less then it'll be less, but it, if it's more, even if they re really have to uh, pay 10,000, 12,000, they can only charge you that $7,000. Right. Okay. There's going to be other little fees for like hooking up um, the utilities and, and everything like that, that can, can vary, but that major uh, development charges and, and levies, you want to make sure that you have that, cap okay and then of course the lawyers would also read through every project is going to be different whether it's uh which which builder it is whether it's in toronto or if it's in durham or if it's in peel whether it's a condo or a townhouse or a detached the lawyer will read through it okay they'll also read through the budget in that they have let's say for it's a condo uh the month the month that's going to be going in and every month for the maintenance fees uh for the reserve fund to make sure that it will won't, it shouldn't be going up anytime soon right because there's enough going in there to cover anything that may break or anything that needs fixing and right. um so on yeah and um, uh, actually earlier this year i had a client that i i met and um she was telling me about her experience with the whole levy and development fees that she had no clue about she did not get a lawyer to cap those fees and by the time her place was closing, she owed the developer about $40,000. Yeah. And I was, Lord, I was like, wow, $40,000. That's not easy money. That's another down payment if you, you know what I mean? 
And it's yeah. just crazy because we're not educated enough and we're not taught to look at the fine prints and really speak to the right people. Um, and that's why you need a team of people that are gonna help you and guide you in the right direction because she ended up putting herself into further debt. Thank God she had a line of credit that she was able to fall onto. Um, but that's an additional interest. That's an additional loan. That's an additional debt. Like you're talking about credit, you know, and making sure that your debt amounts are low. Imagine now having to go apply for a mortgage and there's an additional $30,000, $40,000 of debt that just came out of nowhere because of all these unexpected costs that you weren't expecting to come up. Right. And, and that's also the, the, the fees that we're talking about right now, the cap, the development charges and levies, that's aside from your land transfer tax, your lawyer fees and everything. Um, what, for people who are not buying pre-constructions, of course, those levies and development fees are not affiliated with, with the cost, correct? Uh, yeah, correct. Exactly. It's only for a, a new build, a new home that you purchase. Right. So people who are looking at purchasing a house that ha has already been developed, um, are there any other things that we should be kind of looking out for? Uh, yes. And for your finances, okay? Uh, you wanna have steady income, okay? Um, because owning a house, uh, you have to be very responsible. You have to pay your bills and if there's unexpected expenses, uh, so most likely a steady income can obviously sustain you for your monthly bills and the unexpected expenses. Right. Um, so one of the first steps, any, any, any buyer, first time home buyer, or if you already own, obviously you want to get your finances in order. Um, and I always recommend a financial advisor, but we'll get into that a little later. Right. Um, uh, because uh, what happens anyways, is the banks, they use a debt ratio formula. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, the GDS, the growth debt service ratio, and the TDS, your total debt ratio, uh, to see if they want to give you that loan. Okay, right now with the new rules, it's a 35 uh, for the GDS and 42 for the, TD, to the TDS. I'm not going to get too much into that. I always recommend for, for that section, you talk to a mortgage special, specialist, but I'm just okay. going to give you a brief um, understanding of it. Okay, so it's pretty much your debt load. Uh, what you owe, what you can pay every month, how much you make, right? right? So in order for them to loan you, in order for you to get that mortgage, um, it doesn't mean that you have to be completely debt free, right. but the lower your debt load is, the more likely they will give you a mortgage. And on the, the other side of that, regardless if the lower your, your, your debt load is of your credit card, your student loans, maybe you have car payments. Now, when you get your mortgage, you get your health and you have to be paying $2,000 a month, $2,500 a month. It should be more easier for you. You should feel more comfortable knowing that you only have to pay that versus you have to pay $2,500 a month, $300 on your credit card, $400 on your car payment, $200 on your student loan. It just will add up and you don't want to get overwhelmed like that. Right. Um, uh, so, and then aside from that, of course, it's your finances. Um, once again, I'm going to tell you to go to a mortgage specialist for each individual because it's going to be it's going to vary based on your uh, credit score, uh, your uh, debt load, uh, and then how much you make. But for example, anyone who someone who has a clean slate, okay, right, um, and at the mortgage qualifying rate right now, 4.94. That's just the qualifying rate that they're going to uh, test you at. Let's say you may be able to you should be able to get a lower rate after that, but the testing rate of 4.94. Uh, and let's say your GDS limit was about 39. Right. And you made $100,000 a year. If you make $100,000 a year, you qualify for a house that's about $460,000. Mm. Okay. Prior to this, there's some of the same exact thing. They would qualify at $524,000. That's about $60,000 difference. So they definitely tightened up since uh, everything that's going on in the world and just with the market in general. Right. Um, if, you, if you make, once again, if you make about a hundred, everyone's is going to vary, but if you make about $100,000, you put down about 10%, you would qualify to look at a house that's about $462,000. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I definitely, uh, 
want to tell people, I know, wow, if you make $100,000 and I can only buy a house that's $460,000 and I, I want to live in Toronto and houses are 800000 <laughs> it's yeah. the reality. It is the reality. And that's, once again, like, I'm not trying to scare people off because you can do it. I mean, you can save, uh, you can uh, get a, a, a part-time job, maybe start a business um, for the and and find different creative there's different creative ways um to to get into that market are you flexible right. and are you willing to move a little bit out outside are you willing to start with like maybe a condo live in there for a while sell it take the the equity the, what uh depreciation and then buy your home right right um but back to that like the creative ways to build your down payment let's say right, right. I, I, I talk to some people, you know, and not everybody, but they're not willing to make that sacrifice. They're saying they want to get into help, but they're not willing to. And, and that's not to the ones who have made the sacrifice. And, right. and kudos to you guys, right? right? But you need to cut back on your expenses, Absolutely. right? Cut back on your expenses for the bigger picture. Right. Um, like a simple thing like writing down what you make every month versus what you're spending every month. Sometimes you'll be shocked that you're actually spending more than you're making. And you're like, how is that even possible? Right. 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 Uh, but, but $50 here, hundred dollars there. It's, it's going to add it up quickly. And I know we've all, we've all heard it before. And I know you, you as a, as a great financial advisor, you know, people spend money on food and dinners, clothes and shoes, partying, et cetera, what, whatever. Right. Um, but it, it adds up and they're over, they're overspending. Okay. okay. So, if you can cut back, if you can look at your finances, your budget, uh, that, that's one way to save for your down payment and be prepared. Um, another way, like I said, if you can start like a little business um, or a part-time job, I know it's not that easy in the, in what's going on in the world, um, but if you could start maybe a, a, a small business because right now, most of us are I'm pretty sure we're, we're looking in our phone or on Instagram or on social media. So why not research um, business idea, start a one or two and put it on the social media. Let other people look like, hey, yeah, look at this new business. Let me, let me pass this on to somebody, right? right? So those are, those are some, some ideas. And uh, one of the big sacrifices that people can do is, and this one is easier to send it down, but maybe live with a family member or a friend. Right. Right. I, I know people can get on each other's nerves, but if you can, you can <laughs> cut, cut a lot of cost in right. terms of rent by living with someone um, that, that, that is a big one. And if you can trust, if you have someone who you can trust, and I know a lot of people may not have that, but if you can find someone that you can trust who has, who's like-minded like you, who wants to get a property, who wants to have that generational wealth, sorry, that generational wealth, then you guys can maybe come, come together and save together. And then now you make a hundred thousand, let's say, and the other person makes eighty thousand. Now your income combined is one hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Now you can maybe qualify for like seven hundred, seven fifty, or or whatever it may be the case, depending on your down payment and everything, right? Right. Um, but my my main back to it now that I've been talking about a little bit, but I would recommend them to come talk to a financial advisor such as yourself. Right. Um, and I know I'm on this um, this 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 channel right now. So it's not, it's not me trying to say, oh, heart free is amazing just to say it. It is the facts. And I know a lot of people are using that word right now, but it, it is. If you go around, if you ask people, you see the reviews, you see her page and everything like that, you'll see that how, how thrilled, how uh, appreciative they are of her helping them out. And it's not only about to get that down payment, but to help you with like your debt right? Uh, your credit, your budgeting, everything. And that total package can speed up your process to get a home. But I just wanted to kind of mention off or piggyback, at least I should say, on some of the things that you just mentioned um, in terms of creative ways to build up your down payment. One yeah, thing is, you know, you talked about discipline, um, cutting back on your expenses and things of that sort. And um, I just want to kind of to like, emphasize the importance of that and you know being in this position where I am seeing people's finances on a regular basis 
I see consumerism literally at an all-time high. Our incomes are literally here. Our lifestyles are here. And if we really just kind of bring it down like this, we can see that we're actually richer than we actually think. A lot of us are spending money recklessly. And it's really simply because of the fact that everything is at the tip of our finger. Instant gratification is at an all-time high. I want this now. I see it. I like it. I tap it. I buy it. Like it's at the front door. There's not much of a thinking process uh, into that anymore, right? And I think a lot of times when I tell people that there is no shortcut answer, there is no um, get quick rich scheme, everything takes time and it takes process and it takes discipline. Because I see on a regular basis, like people spending upwards six to eight hundred dollars um, on Ubers alone, and that's just take wow. wow. we still haven't talked about when we go to restaurants and things like that. And I'm sure that, you know, during the pandemic, of course, we're not out partying and popping bottles every weekend. We're not, you know, spending money on restaurants as much because places are closed down, but people are spending online like crazy. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, people were scared back in March. And then by April, May, people's online shopping was just going through the roof. I see um, at people's doorsteps, you know, mail, pretty much every single day <laughs> and uh, you know I remember when I sat down with you I had literally just graduated from school and all I had to my name at that time was my student loan debt I didn't have any savings and I remember um you know really once you broke down everything to me I was like okay you know what I need to cut down cut this 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 that the other and I was able to build my 20 percent down payment in a span of three years and people say oh really like what did you do somebody helped you your parents helped you your man a man helped you no guys no man helped me my parents didn't help me none of that kind of stuff it really boiled down to the discipline. Like I picked up five, I had five jobs, four of them were cash because I wasn't trying to pay a whole lot of taxes because I'm not trying to work just to pay back the man. But I picked up four cash jobs. I had my regular full-time job. I disciplined myself. I saved, I saved, I saved every little penny. I barely went out. I don't go out. I don't care about, you know, like we, we talked about this the other day, like celebrations, birthdays. It went from a birthday get together to a birthday day to a birthday week to a birthday month we <laughs> literally have like three different events just for one person's birthday and then we have like three birthdays four birthdays a month and then you talked about you know pulling up with friends or family that you trust um to be able to build that down payment with because it, it is getting tougher and tougher for millennials to be able to buy a house the cost of living is going up our incomes are not growing um, the house prices are going up every single year and it's just not getting easier. So, you know, pulling up your resources um, and that's something that I can kind of talk about from like just my own community. Like, you know, people don't know I'm Indian and a lot of people know that Indians are known for packing up a house with, you know, three, four, five families at a time. And a lot of times I hear people say, oh, well, Indians just get along so well. One thing is... <laughs> not far from the truth is that we don't all get along but the <laughs> the thing that we are good at is putting our differences to the side when need when push comes to shove because if you want to you know be able to get to your first house you got to do what you got to do and i remember like my right. own dad he used to tell me that when he first when he first came um to canada he was here you know illegally and he was living with 11 of his other illegal friends <laughs> in a one bedroom apartment and they were all paying $30 each for rent. And they had to do what they had to do to get to where they need to be. And sometimes we don't think about the short term um, sacrifices for the long term gains. And I think it's so important for us to start analyzing those things as well. That, that That's actually a big part of it is a lot of people, because when I'm dealing with people, it's like, oh man, I have to save for like two, three years. Uh, I can't wait by then. The market's gonna be like this, gonna be like that. That's a lot of, but no, if you're patient, three years is, Look how quickly uh, we're we're ready in 2020. If you can remember 2017, and now we're in 2020. In 2020, I know there's a lot going on. It's already finished. Exactly. Remember when the pandemic started, and it's already almost January. Exactly. Right? Uh, so you have to be disciplined. You have to be patient, and especially if you're trying to get on. If you if you if you're if you're not disciplined now, and back to the whole saving um, for your down payment, um, paying down your debts and everything. When you get your house and you have a mortgage and you're not doing, you're missing your payments, you're not saving and, and you're not paying your bills. 
then you're going to potentially lose your home, right? Exactly. So the, the, you got to be patient, absolutely. Yeah, no, um, honestly, patience is such an important factor and, and it kind of leads to, um, you know, the, this last question that I wanted to ask you is that whether it's your clients or people you've encountered, what are some of the most common mistakes that people make? And I think that if I can just kind of add into that, I think the fact that when people are not patient, you want something right now without fully preparing for what you need in the future is like one of the common mistakes that I see people do is because they want it right away. They want it right away. They have no patience, but they're not ready for it, right? So what are some of the common things that you have noticed or heard of in terms of um, home ownership when, they, when people are getting into their first house? All right. So I'm gonna get back to that. Right. I know I, I just want to hit one more point because we already talked about credit. Right. Uh, we talked about down payment. We talked about your finance and your debt. And then uh, I would say the last key point would be the pre-approval. Right. Okay. Uh, and once again, like I said, you can always talk to a financial advisor after this for more details on that technique and talk to me as a realtor about, about more details about this uh, or a mortgage specialist when it's done. So we're just giving some key points. So when it comes to the pre-approval, um, that, that would be the, the, the last step, I would say, uh, you would have to, uh, go to a lender or, uh, an independent broker, uh, so that you can see what you actually qualify for. Right. Okay. Uh, a, a mortgage free approval doesn't mean that you actually have the mortgage at that time, but it gives you an idea so that when I'm personally showing you a place that you're not looking for a house that's. 600,000 and you only qualify for 400,000. Right. Because that's that's just going to be heartbreaking. We're going to go, we're going to look at a house, you're going to say you want this house, put in an offer uh, for even less, let's say even 550, and then all of a sudden you go to the bank and they say you only have qualified for 400, you can't get that house. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> it also, <laughs> it also uh, gives you an idea of how much you'll be uh, paying every month. So like let's say you buy a house at 500,000, they'll tell you you probably qualify at like 2.1 interest rate. You're gonna be looking at about $2,100 a month if you put down 5% or around let's say $1,800 a month if you put down 20%. Right. Okay, so after we look at all of those things, we're, before I even start showing anyways, I'll say let's go to a pre, get a pre-approval. Let's see what the numbers that we're gonna be looking into, okay? Right. I just wanted to mention that so that everyone can understand that. Um, so some of the mistakes though, now when we start looking and everything, okay, there, there's a few, um, whether it's my clients, like you said, or just, um, other realtors, what they, they, they deal with is one of them is, um, not fully understanding the market. Right. Right. That's one of the big ones, of course. So like we talked about, like in Toronto houses are like 800,000, but people want that big house and they know they qualify at about like five, six hundred dollars, a hundred thousand dollars. It, it's just not going to happen. Right. Okay. Uh, the market is what the market is. Okay. So you have to be a little bit flexible, compromise yep. a little bit and be willing. If you want a big house, you're going to have to move out further. Okay. Or yep. else you're going to have to potentially be patient, right? You yep. can, you can save up more, or like I said, um, join, join with someone else who um, can help you with a uh, down payment or the income part of it. Or you can buy like a condo, live in it, or rent it out, and then use that money to buy the house, okay? Um, the other thing is um, people are always waiting for that perfect house, right? That's one step. Well, I can walk to the highway. I can, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, all the, all the, um, the all um, crown mold in, in every single section, um, the light fixtures, finished basement, separate entrance, and then once again at four hundred thousand okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. dollars. <laughs> I'm laughing because I, I I love the home garden channel, and when I used to watch it more often, that was one of the things that I would notice right. that first time home buyers get so fixated on their wish list, and right. <laughs> they really just don't even um, realize that their wish list also comes with a wishful price. <laughs> exactly so that, that's it exactly so i mean i can get you that house if you have the right budget you have the right finances and the savings right, right. so and, and what happens because of that when we go now i don't push people into things that's my character that's my nature i don't want to force someone who's going to put in such a large uh, expense 
um, and they're going to be the ones paying the monthly bills into something. But I will guide you. But we'll go look at some houses, and I'll be like, yeah, this house is nice. What do you think? They'll be like, yeah, I love this house. And then we'll go on and move on and, and see some other houses, hoping to see that perfect house. And by the time they turn around and realize, no, that other house was actually amazing compared to these others. Right. In this, in this market, even during COVID, it's gone. Right. There's bidding wars on, on these properties, even during COVID, depending on the area, of course. Like I'm showing places in Durham, uh, Bowmanville, Oshawa. Uh, you know, it, there's still bidding wars. Okay. So, that, that's that's one of the, that's some of the mistakes that uh, people make. And when you talk about bidding wars, actually as well, uh, don't get too caught up in the bidding wars. Right. If the house is if they're marketing the price, the the value of the house at four hundred thousand just to draw people in, but it is worth let's say five hundred thousand, don't just jump to six hundred thousand because you just feel you have to get into market. You need that property. You right. can go up a little bit, maybe five twenty-five, five fifty, you know, but you don't want to go past your budget, past what it's valued at. Right. Uh, overly okay so don't get too emotionally uh connected to the houses these, don't get caught up in these bidding wars and and everything like that um another important thing is that like i said not some people are doing this on their own but if you do have some people helping you or if you do have um your family member maybe a brother or sister your mom or your dad whoever it may be right let them tag along let them come, let them help you look at the house, give their opinion. Doesn't mean that their opinion is 100% accurate, but bring some along with you and to help you with the process as well. Right. Okay, so I find a lot of people that, is, you know, sometimes you want to only do it by yourself, but sometimes it makes it easier if you can get that help or that, that, that second, um, that second uh, opinion, right? right. Uh, keep, keep in mind that <laughs> sometimes friends mean well, Right. But they will also steer you in the wrong direction when it comes to <laughs> It's kind of like that. I always tell people that we go get our money advice from our our barbers or, you know, people who have nothing to do with the industry and don't know themselves. And then we go look for advice from those people. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Um, you some people are saying, yeah, my friend is saying, yeah, no, don't buy a house, don't buy a, a condo, don't buy, don't buy, don't buy into the market. Uh, <laughs> And meanwhile, there's two scenarios. There's there's a friend that's telling them that, and meanwhile, they're buying a property. Right. <laughs> you know? And then, of course, there's the ones that, that are truly not buying the property, but it's like, what do they have going for themselves to be telling you that? Do they, right. Because they don't want you to get married. So just, just let them talk, but try to listen and see if what they're saying is true. Right. Okay. Um, and then the final two things I think that, um, that so mistakes that I, I can give right now anyways is, um, it's, it's really important that even when I'm telling some people sometimes, I know sometimes it just slips your mind because you're so excited you bought the place. Um, now you're like just in such a, a joyful spirit and everything. You, you may forget that you the closing costs are coming up, whether it's a pre-construction in three years or a resale house that you bought and closing in two months, three months. Don't forget to still prepare and save your money and still stay on budget so that you have the money ready for closing, right? Um, so that's one of them. And then the last one, you actually kind of talked about it earlier about when you first bought it. And then the anxiety or the buyer's remorse that some people get. I want to tell everybody that it is normal, especially right. for a first time home buyer. It is so normal to me. When I see it now, it's like, hey guys, don't worry. You know, I, I can just tell them like, you're, you're putting down so much money and you're committing yourself to, to such a big purchase, even though it's going to, um, in my opinion, and from what I've been seeing, that it's going to uh, help you in the future. Obviously, like we talked about generational wealth for your yeah. family, if you have kids, um, to retire early and everything like that. It's a large purchase. So you're naturally going to feel something like, oh my gosh, what did I just get myself into? Right. But as the time passes, the weeks pass, the months pass, it's also normal now that everyone's like, yes, I'm glad I did this. Oh, right. thank you that you helped me with this and everything like that. So they say thank you to me, but I always say thank you guys for working with me. You know, you guys are the ones that listen. Like I said, there's some people that I talked to maybe two years ago, and then just this year they're like, hey, guess what? I'm ready. I'm like, oh, hey, I, I remember I was working with you. You know, I was listening to what you said. I was saving. You know, I was disappearing. That's what I tell people. Disappear. Mm -hmm. Not going out, not hard, not, not spending your money on, on things that they don't need. That's just going to go away anyways. And then... You'll be when they come back and they're ready to purchase the house. 
know, and they're teaching me now. At this point, they're teaching me, like, yeah, I did this, this, and that. These are the numbers. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. No, you nailed everything on the head. And I, I can definitely attest to the buyer's remorse. I remember when I put my down payment when I was with you. I know I had 10 days. Oh my goodness. The amount of times I went back to the drawing board was unbelievable. I wrote that plan over and over, like <laughs> over that 10 day period. And I was like, oh my God, maybe this is the, this is not, this is not it. This is not what I should be doing. I need to pull out, but you know, thank God. I, I I'm glad that I, I stuck through it because like you said, as time goes on, those days go on weeks, months, and years and you start to, it becomes normal. It's, it's just another thing that you have to take care of as you uh, would have to do with anything else. And the buyer's remorse starts to slowly fade away, especially as you become more comfortable in, in the knowledge, as your income starts to grow, hopefully your income is growing um, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And so, you know, with that being said, I really wanna thank you so much, Ola, for your time, for being here with me today and sharing your wealth of knowledge. And I'm sure that so many viewers at home are going to benefit from the information that you had to share with us, um, because these are really, really important things for us to start thinking about when we are looking at home, home ownership. It's not just about the down payment. It's so much more than that. And it's so important that you as the consumer, the first time home buyer, you do your due diligence before you get yourself into anything. And if you're looking for more information, if you're looking to get financially prepared, if you're looking to get connected with Ola, then please hit the uh, link below with all my information, my contact information. I'm here to help you. We're here to help you get into the right home at the right time with your current situation and help you improve in every step of the way. And also don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button so you can get your daily information. Um, and Ola, thank you so much again for being here with me. I really, really appreciate it. I'm sure that, you know, um, obviously we're going to be working together uh, closely as we always do. And I'm super excited for us to grow together and help other people in our communities grow as well. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.